The first car was invented just some 140 years ago. However, since its invention, the humble automobile has revolutionized how we transport goods and people, and to an extent, the way we live. Nowadays, driving is an act that most of us have fully integrated into our lives, from work, to shopping, to vacationing. Its convenience and comfort allows us to go wherever we want, whenever we want. However, just like plastic bags, industrial farming, or just about anything that we rely on to make our lives more convenient, driving also significantly makes our world a worse place. Environmentally, road transportation alone contributes to 11% of all yearly CO2 emissions, as well as most pollutants measured by the Air Quality Index. Fun fact, if you go on an AQI forecasting website, you can find out where a city's arterial roads are by simply looking at the bright orange lines on the map. Speaking of negative health impacts, cars directly kill 1.3 million people yearly, making it the 8th most likely cause of death for people between the age of 8 to 55. On top of the myriad of health and environmental problem it causes, car-oriented infrastructure design is detrimental to our economic health as well. The average Canadian spends around 60 minutes on their commute, that's thousands of hours wasted every single day on an activity that produces zero economic and personal benefit, just like the infrastructure that supports our car addiction. For most cities in the United States, there are more parking lots than people, which results in around 800 million parking lots for its 330 million residences. Of course, the economic benefits of being connected to a nationwide highway network cannot be understated. And there are initiatives like Vision Zero and electric vehicle subsidies that aim to reduce the negative health and environmental impact of car-dependent infrastructure. However, to some, it seems like it's too little too late. The simplest and the most effective solution is to rid of driving altogether. Just like its predecessor, the horse carriage, cars are being slowly driven out of our cities. However, this time, the change is being spearheaded by government legislations instead of technological advances. California recently passed a law that would give each person $1,000 per year if they don't own a car. Car-free areas are being proposed in major metropolitan areas such as Berlin and Paris. In a world of rapid urbanization, it would seem that we're heading towards a car-free future. However, is this idea really viable? Recently, I visited Plateau de Montréal, a neighborhood of Montreal known for its walkable streets and medium density developments. However, something caught my attention during my trip. Despite being close to both mass and active transit options, the streets are still littered with cars. It appears that even those who live in walkable neighborhoods still choose to own cars. In theory, people living here should have easy access to every type of amenities they need. Why do they still feel the need to own cars? Despite being a walkable neighborhood in and of itself, cities and neighborhoods surrounding it are still car dependent, and traveling to and from these areas to the downtown core remains a major hassle for transit users. Sure, VIA Rail provides services to other major Canadian cities, and EXO provides commuter service to the Montreal suburbs, but these services are either too expensive or are too inflexible to be used on a regular basis. Alternative modes of transportation, such as car sharing, has presented itself as an alternative to car ownership, but due to supply and demand, these services are unavailable when they're the most needed. Thus, private car ownership remains the only solution for intercity trips. As such, the appeal of car ownership is great even for those living in a walkable area. This is not to mention the impossibility of not owning a car in a typical North American suburb. However, despite the many difficulties and impossibilities of zero cars, it is undeniable that our modern society has become too reliant on the convenience automobiles provide. We shouldn't aim to get rid of cars completely, rather to encourage an environment where we're no longer entirely dependent on them for our day-to-day -day lives. This is where government policy can come into play. Banning cars from city centers seem like a radical step because for most North Americans, it is almost impossible to go a single day without driving. But despite their car ownership, 
Driving is not a daily necessity for the residents here. Instead of car-dominated boulevards, narrow, walkable streets covered by shades of tree canopies can be found everywhere. Grocery stores, cafes, and restaurants are no more than a few minutes' walk away. And despite not having a single building over three floors, this neighborhood is one of the densest area in North America. This density and walkability also foster the growth of local independent stores. In stark contrast to a typical suburban shopping center filled with chain stores and franchised restaurants. And the benefits of a walkable neighborhood doesn't just stop at economics. Studies have shown that not only independent stores are more likely to stay in business longer, its residences also share a stronger social bond, are less likely to be below the poverty line, and are generally more prosperous than their car-dependent counterparts. It should come as no surprise that people living in walkable neighborhoods prioritize active and mass transit options more than driving. In a world where most of the world's population is expected to live in cities, building walkable neighborhoods would not only help to reduce our impact on the environment, it would also reduce the amount of direct and indirect health impact that driving brings us. There really is no reason not to build more walkable neighborhoods in the future. However, building a city free from car dependency isn't exactly a walk in the park. It requires significant reform to our existing government zoning policies and bylaws. Luckily, at least in Canada, projects are already underway to reform previous car dependent areas. Take Toronto, for example. A large part of the city was developed right after the Second World War. And just like any other post-war development, these areas are built catered exclusively towards driving. However, the city is making a significant push to redevelop and rezone these areas. Through significant pavement marking changes and bylaw amendments, the city is planning to turn what was once strip mall filled boulevards into high density, walkable neighborhoods. But what about suburbs? Most North American cities have pre-existing mass transit options in their downtown cores, but suburbs lack that kind of infrastructure to support high density developments. In this case, the answer is quite simple and straightforward. Build more mass transits. Take for example, Montreal's RAM project. Its first phase is projected to be open on December 1st, providing rapid connection for the city's South Shore commuters to downtown Montreal. It also provided opportunities and justifications for developers to construct high-density, mixed-use development around the RAM station thereby creating a way to sustainably grow the city's population. These kinds of suburban, transit-oriented developments can be found all over Canada, from Montreal, to Toronto, to Vancouver. The fact is, mass transit projects don't just benefit existing commuters, it also opens up new possibilities for suburbs to grow their population without relying on roads and sprawl. Creating a future without cars is simply too unrealistic. However, it cannot be denied that our cities have been designed to be entirely dependent on them. The goal of our current urban planning policies shouldn't aim to get rid of cars completely. Rather, it should foster an environment where walking and transit is so convenient that driving no longer becomes a necessary part of life. Hey folks, thanks for watching yet another video. Please leave a like and subscribe if you have enjoyed. This is the Transportation Channel, and as always, I'll see you next time.